Good morning. It's good to see all of you here. Good to be with you. As a, perhaps a clue from the song we just sang, uh, we're going to talk about the birth of Jesus, so I encourage you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. We've been slowly studying through that, and we're finally in chapter 2. So as that song talks about some of those, some of, there's a rich song we just sang. There's a, a lot of Old Testament prophetic allusions there. We're not going to touch on all those. If I had uh, looked at this song, I maybe would have brought in some additional things. <laughs> but uh, we're going to talk about the, the angels uh, praising and proclaiming the birth of Christ. And a lot of good stuff there. Luke chapter 2. So the good news, the birth of Jesus. The, the coming of the Messiah and, and the gospel. So the, the good news, the gospel, those are synonymous. Sometimes we'll translate it one way or the other, but uh, gospel means good news, and good news means gospel. And we're talking about Jesus coming and all of the good things he's done for us and the promises we have through him. But the points we're going to look at, and uh, if, you're, if you've got a bulletin, we're trying a new thing to have a, a place where you can pay attention there. And if you like taking notes, there's a little fill-ins there. And you don't have to scramble it right now. We're going to go through these in the lesson. But um, this the idea of the good news, the gospel, we're going to talk about these points. That it's ordained by God. It's prophesied by God. It's God's plan. And it's arranged by Caesar. And that may sound like a weird point. We'll say unwittingly. Not that... Not that Caesar wanted to do that, but, but God uses rulers and nations to do his will. The, go the good news or the gospel was adapted to by Joseph and Mary with uh, the birth of Jesus. That wasn't their plan. These things were proclaimed by angels, as we just sang about. And the angels were proclaiming that to the shepherds. And those shepherds then told of the good news. And then... Uh, Preached by, today, this is kind of the application, preached by you and me. And if you look at the, the bulletin and the underline and, and you see, oh, that's Matt's outline, preached by Matt DeVore. Well, that's not the answer. It's not preached by Matt DeVore. It's the application preached by us all. Pre we all share uh, and proclaim. Maybe you're more comfortable with the saying proclaim. Maybe we're not all preachers or whatever. But we all have ways that we can share the gospel with others. So let's uh, look at our text, first of all, as we've been doing. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. And I'm kind of going to break it into to two parts, uh, just a, a reading, just to think about it. Uh, verses 1 through 7 are the birth of Jesus actually happening. And then verses 8 through 20 are that business with the, the angels then proclaiming it to the shepherds and the reaction of the shepherds and all of that. So let's, let's read through this together. Luke chapter 2, starting verse 1. <clears throat> In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went down to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And you might have a different translation. We'll talk about that. But verses 8 through 20 is where the angels and shepherds come here. Verse 8, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with, with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news, or the gospel, of great joy that will be 
for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with an angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. So, all these points are in there, one way or another, that this was ordained by God, arranged by Caesar, adapted to by Joseph and Mary, proclaimed by angels, told by the shepherds, and the gospel is to be preached by you and me. What is the, the good news of the gospel? We say those are the same thing, but what is it? It's the coming of the victorious king. He's bringing blessing and salvation. You know, in Romans 1.16, uh, Paul writes, Therefore I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Everybody is, is able to take hold of this blessing and be blessed by the good news. So, of course, in our study here, we're studying the beginning of the gospel, the, the initial coming of Christ in the form of his initial coming as a baby. Of course, he grows, and there's more to this story, certainly. He goes on to lead a perfect life. He's the perfect example. He becomes our perfect sacrifice. He, he has the, the sacrificial death that he undergoes for us, and he's buried, but then he shows victory over death. He's the first fruits of the resurrection. And if we follow him in faithful lives of obedience, and accept Jesus as our Lord, then we receive forgiveness of sins and the gift of salvation and that hope of resurrection and everlasting life to be forever with him in the, in the city of God, as we talked about in he Hebrews this morning. So the first point is ordained by God. The gospel or the good news here is ordained by God. God orchestrated and planned. This is his plan of redemption or scheme of redemption, as some say. And here, earlier in Luke, we even see that. We saw this in our earlier lessons from Luke 1, 16, where uh, we're talking about John preparing the way for the Lord here. It says, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So it's not just in the sense, well, God up in heaven is wanting this to happen. Certainly that's true. But it's for the Lord, for Jesus coming, on, coming to the earth. John's preparing the people to receive Jesus on the earth. And then in verse, uh, verses uh, 30 through 33, uh, where the angel was talking to Mary, it says, And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, and you will bear a son. It's this Jesus. And you shall call his name Jesus. His name was foreordained. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, the Son of God. And the Lord God will, will give to him the throne of his father David. He's fulfilling that uh, promise of this king to come in the, in the line of David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever in his kingdom. Of his kingdom there will be no end. 
Mary's being told all this is going to happen, and now it's happening. God is planning all of this, and it's coming to fruition. Verse 35 of that uh, chapter 1 as well, And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. This is how it's going to happen. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. And this is all foretold and very much reminded us right here before it happened, even though these things had already been prophesied even before that. Uh, we saw, uh, we can read in what Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1, 19 through 20, that he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. And that's where we see Christ has come, but this was planned before the foundation of the world. And even from the beginning, back in Genesis, we see in Genesis 3, 15, after Adam and Eve had sinned and sort of all the God is telling them what's going on now and giving the curses, it says there, I will make enemies of you and the woman, talking to the serpent, the devil, I will make enemies of you and the woman and of your offspring and her descendant. He, Jesus, this Messiah to come, he shall bruise you, the serpent, on the head, a death blow, and you, the serpent, will bruise him on the heel, uh, an injury, but not to ultimate death. And we understand that as we see the whole story unfold, of course. That's referring to how, yes, Jesus did die on the cross, but he had victory over death. It was not a death blow in the sense that we might think, whereas the devil, as we read through Revelation, he gets cast in the lake of fire. Jesus is victorious over these things. And we see in Isaiah. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now there in that immediate context in which Isaiah is writing, and we're talking to King Ahaz, uh, he had put his faith in Assyria instead of in God, and, and so there may be a, a fulfillment of some things up there, but not the full fulfillment that we see in Christ, that that uh, we see Mary, a virgin, miraculously conceiving, and we see Jesus coming and to fulfill this role of being Emmanuel, which means God with us. God came to earth in the form of Jesus and was with us and did all of the things that we're going to read about as we study through Luke here. So as we think about this idea that was ordained by God, the gospel was ordained by God, that God had planned to send Jesus before the foundations of the world. We read about there in Genesis, in the very beginning we see that this seed was coming, this offspring was going to be victorious, and how uh, the virgin shall conceive in Isaiah. God's word will not turn, return to him void. Uh, God plans these things out, and it's not maybe going to happen. It's absolutely going to happen, and of course, it does happen in Christ. So there's a sense in which the, the gospel was arranged by Caesar. Unwittingly, God uses kings and nations to bring about his will. Now here in our context, Luke 2, right at the beginning, it says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And so uh, Augustus Caesar, or o Octavian Caesar, other name he has. Um, he's the, the emperor of the Roman Empire, and Quirinius is under him, one of the governors of the region of Syria, and that would encompass Judea, which is, of course, this land where Jesus is that we're talking about. And so this, uh, these, these leaders were thinking, well, we're going to do our regular business. You know, they would do these registrations for two reasons sort of like what we might think of as a draft, to draft soldiers into the army. Now, the Jews, through the political system there, actually had an exemption from that, so that wouldn't have been what it would have been for them. But the other reason was for taxes, to sort of register to make sure who everybody is and their property and that sort of thing, so that they could be accountable for their taxes. 
So that's that's their motivation. Like, well, we gotta get the money. We gotta make sure we have enough soldiers. We're gonna do this thing throughout the empire, and uh, that's what they thought they were doing. But God meant it for good in a different way. God uses these events to orchestrate for Mary and Joseph to be in in uh, the right place at the right time. We even read in Micah 5, 2 in the Old Testament, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. So maybe a little cryptic as we think about that, but you know, one of the things to point out, Ephrathah is a, one of the ancient names for this same place. Bethlehem there had two names. And we see that the Messiah was to come from Bethlehem, the city where King David was born. And so, unbeknownst to Caesar, who's just trying to raise money, he actually orchestrates these things for then Mary and Joseph to be going to that right place in Bethlehem for Jesus to be born. God often uses pagan kings to accomplish his plans. Even back in Isaiah 10, 5 through 6, we see here, uh, Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, the staff in their hands is my fury. Against a godless nation I send him. God is sending Assyria against nations such as uh, Judah and Israel, mostly Israel, Against the people of my wrath, I command him to take spoil and seize plunder and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. And verse 7, but he does not so intend. It's not that Assyria is trying to, oh, let me do what you want, God. They're, they're just thinking they're doing their natural business, but God is orchestrating these things for judgment to occur. He does not so intend and his heart does not so think, but it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off nations, not a few. So kings unwittingly fulfill God's plans. Assyria took Israel and damaged Judah due to their wickedness. So God planned for that to be that way. But of course, thinking about Judah, who was ultimately defeated not by Assyria, but by Babylon. Similarly, in the beginning of Daniel, we read, In the third year of the king of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. The Lord gave the king of Judah into Nebuchadnezzar, this pagan king of Babylon's hand. And along with some of the things from the temple. And it all sounds very bad, just desecrating the temple and taking God's people. It's God's plan to judge his people who had been so wicked. But Nebuchadnezzar didn't know, didn't realize that he was doing God's will in that. So this idea of the gospel was arranged by Caesar. These nations can unwittingly do these things. God is all powerful. Uh, he often lets us choose. And we sometimes choose poorly. But we sometimes see these points in history where God, God's hand is in control and and. and keeping things the way that he wants them to be. Nothing is outside of his control. He is not at the mercy of the events of history, but rather he's, his designs are accomplishing his will. So this good news was adapted to by Joseph and Mary. And that wasn't their plan. You, you could imagine that it introduced a certain element of chaos into the, their lives, you know, uh, they were supposed to get married. They were betrothed, but they weren't completely married in the sense that we would think. It was somewhere between an engagement and a marriage in our culture. Um, but this sort of put a monkey wrench in it. Well, in fact, uh, Joseph was uh, about to divorce Mary, learning that, well, we're not together yet, but she's pregnant. This is a disaster. I'm not marrying her. Uh, and then Matthew's account explains that an angel comes and... and uh, lets him know what's going on and that he should take her as his wife. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit. But you can just imagine the, the uh, rumors and, and maybe some shame, even though it shouldn't have been, it wasn't shameful. Everything was right and good here, but there was probably people had the wrong idea about this. So they had to adapt. 
and they had to go to Bethlehem in reaction to this, this uh, registration that was going on. See here in Luke 2, 4 through 5, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered because of Caesar and this rule, there with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. So they're adapting to those things. Joseph didn't plan that trip. It wasn't to go buy a new car or something. They didn't have cars anyway. He had to go for this, this whole law with Caesar and Quirinius having this registration, probably to pay their taxes or at least to register for their taxes. He got Mary to the right place to fulfill scripture, even though they didn't quite realize why they were doing that other than to pay their taxes. But verse 6 here, But while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So this is a crazy situation. And of course, there's so much uh, tradition wrapped up in the story, and there's movies and plays, and there's an innkeeper. There's no innkeeper mentioned here. And, and, and uh, the translation I'm using here even talks about a guest room. Uh, this is the same word that's used... Uh, where uh, Jesus is going to have the Passover, and he says, you know, there will be a room prepared, and they're going to have the upper room. It's, it's sort of an upper room in a home. Uh, there's a different word that's used in the parable of the uh, the Good Samaritan, where where they put him up in an inn. There's not the word used here. So it could, it could be a, a room in an inn, but it's more likely it could be referring to the way the homes were at that time. They had... Uh, of like a front room where their animals were, kind of like a garage maybe in our house. We have a lot of times we have an attached garage. Well, they would have kind of a barn attached to their house, and then they'd have a guest room upstairs. But uh, there's so much going on. There, were, there would have been uh, this registration. There would have been lots of families coming in. And so one way to, to understand these verses is that uh, Joseph and Mary came to Joseph's hometown where there was family, and there was other family coming too, and so the, the family home was so full that they didn't have enough room in the normal guest room. So the overflow space was here in the, the front of the home there with the animals. And so that could, could be one way to explain why Jesus ended up being in a, in a manger. Um, one thing to think about this verse is, is that uh, there's a... A normal thing and a weird thing. She wrapped him tightly in cloth. You know, we, we, we had our kids and we wrapped them. We said we wrapped them like a burrito. <laughs> they kept them all, you know, like that. And I think probably a lot of us have done that. That's sort of a normal, a normal practice is just to wrap the, the baby tightly to keep them uh, comforted and that sort of thing. But it's not normal to throw your baby in a trough with animal feet. That's the weird part of the story. That's not what you normally do. And so that's why it's a sign then to the to the uh, to the shepherds that there's going to be this woman who that loves her baby and is taking care of it well, but it's in a feed trough. So there's there's the, the sign that they would have. So they're adapting to all this stuff. It's a crowded house. They're birth probably in the animal part of the house, and uh, having to put there's not really a crib or whatever, not really much room, and so they had to put Jesus into this feeding trough or a manger. So Mary is blessed among women, and but this wasn't their plan. You know, She got to be the mother of Jesus, but that wasn't really her plan. Uh, but in our lives, maybe things don't always go as planned. You know, um, things can happen in our lives that that are disasters, seem as disasters, and are disasters sometimes in our lives. But but through the course of overcoming those things, we can lead to uh, better things. And blessing God in that and glorifying God, being thankful, maybe learning lessons in those things. You know, maybe a situation with a, a young lady who has a child out of wedlock, that's not how things ought to work. But that may lead to maturity in that young woman. 
and that child may grow to be a great blessing. I've heard stories where a situation like that leads to some great gospel preacher or whatever, uh, and you wouldn't expect that, but that's how things work. Maybe um, someone in a life of sin, uh, but then ultimately lead, leads to repentance, may be able to be uniquely suited to help others that are struggling with that sin. They, they can say, well, I've been there. I've done exactly those things you're doing. But by the grace of God, I have been able to repent and and build, build my life back to what it ought to be through God's grace. And you can do that too. Maybe we have uh, someone pass away or we lose a job or a house fire or any of these kinds of things. As we adapt through these things, they can lead to new blessings. And just think about uh, Job and what he went through. And that could be a whole lesson in itself. But uh, of course, he struggled with those things and then ultimately was able to be blessed by God even even greater. All right, so proclaimed by angels. The gospel was proclaimed by angels here in uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, and we sang in our song as well, right? Uh, and in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. So what, what time of the year would it have been? They didn't, they didn't stay out in the field in the winter. They did it most of the other months, but not in the winter. So we can get a sense of when time of year this was. And an angel of the Lord appeared to, the, to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. So the glory of the Lord, thinking about that, this brilliant light, an amazing thing to see this angel and see this great light in the middle of the night like this. What's going on? You would be pretty freaked out. But of course, the angel of the Lord said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news, the gospel, good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Those are three key attributes of Jesus, right? He's the Savior, and he's Christ and the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You'll find a normal thing and a weird thing. A baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, but lying in a feed trough, lying in a manger. You know, some of these attributes of Jesus here are, are actually attributed to Caesar in some writings. He's the Savior. He's the Son of God. He is a God, that sort of thing. He's the Lord. He's the Master. But of course, those, those are titles that belong to God and to Christ here. The angels proclaiming these things. Verse 13, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. So this, this host we have the angel, the single angel, and this host isn't like the person that seats you at the restaurant, host. This is the word for armies. This is the great God's army. So a multitude of angels are, are there, and they're praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, praising God. And, uh, you know, in, our, in, our, in the song we sang, I think it even refers to the angels singing, and that might be what we're to understand. It doesn't actually say they were singing. It said they were saying, they were praising God and saying this. But uh, they may have been saying it in the form of a song. I don't know. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased or, or uh, among men, I think some translations would say. Praising God. So, this has been, the good news is proclaimed by the angels. They, they know what's going on, and they're telling the shepherds about this good news of this baby that's born, that's the king. The Messiah has come. Go see him. And, the, and there's this sign. There's going to be a normal thing and a weird thing. There's going to be the wrapped in swaddling cloths. Mom's taking care of him. But also, it's going to be weird because he's going to be in a manger. So, they told the good news to the shepherds. And so then what did the shepherds do? They tell the good news as well. 
verse 17. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. So, and when they saw Jesus, they went and visited this, this scene. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. These lowly shepherds were the first gospel preachers. They're telling this good news of what had happened here. They're telling what the angels had told them and what they'd seen. And the hearers wondered at this, the, the wonderful good news. You know, we're hoping for the Messiah to come. Is this the one who's going to free us from our bondage? And of course, they're probably thinking more of that political, physical kind of thing. And we know in the big picture, Jesus came to free us from sin and give us everlasting life. But this is good news. The Messiah has come. Luke 2.20, And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. They're sharing all these things. Now, just as the angels had told them these things, and just as the angels had glorified God, they're doing the same thing. They're echoing those same ideas, glorifying and praising God and sharing what they had heard. So these shepherds received the glorious message from the angels. They saw the glorious newborn king, and they shared the good news with other, others. But what about you and me? We share the good news today. This is, this is our mission. The gospel is shared and preached by you and me. And there's some danger in, in this story and all of the, the tradition around it. And the, the focus on, you know, this is one of those big, big stories that uh, people that maybe even aren't very well versed in the Bible know about the birth of Jesus and, and Christmas and Easter. Those are kind of the two things that people focus on a lot of times. But there's some danger of focusing just on this, this vulnerable baby, as we would see Jesus at this point in the story. He's perhaps he's he's cute and we love that. Uh, he's not demanding anything of us. He's just there, not in a crib, but in a manger to be adored as we enjoy newborn babies. But like the shepherds, we're, we're called to share the good news as well. And, and the whole story, not just the part uh, about he was born. We need to share the gospel. <clears throat> of course, I'm your preacher right now, today. And but does that mean I'm the only one who's supposed to preach the good news? Well, certainly not. We, we all should be proclaiming, gospelizing, evangelizing, sharing this, this good news. Luke 2.10, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for I bring you good news of the great joy that will be for all the people. And so, I underline these words, I bring good news, because in the original language, that's one word. So you can almost try to force it into one word. I gospelize you. <laughs> I am proclaiming the gospel. That's all one, one idea. We should... They're sharing the good news, and we share the good news. That's part of who we are and what we do. The good news of Jesus. Verse 17, And when they saw it, they made known the saying. That's what the shepherds did. They made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. Are we making known the good news about Jesus like the shepherds did? Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, 11, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. We persuade others about Jesus and about following his way of life. His gospel message includes our obedience. <clears throat> and then, of course, what we call the Great Commission, Matthew 28, starting in 18. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
And Jesus is giving this final charge to his disciples and by extension to us as we carry this forward. We are to make disciples. And that involves sharing that, sharing the gospel. We're to persuade others about the good news about Jesus. And as we're making disciples, we do that as we're going about in our lives. And as we're making disciples, we're going to be baptizing them. And as we're making disciples, that involves us teaching them about this good news and about our conduct and how we need to be obedient and have moral lives and follow Jesus' teachings. So the gospel is preached by you and me. And so how are we doing with that? And that's a question for each of us to work on that. And each of our spheres of influence, we all have different people that we come into contact with and can have an influence on to share the gospel, to share the good news about Jesus. These shepherds were pretty excited when they saw that. Can you imagine going over, seeing them angels come out and the bright light, and then you go and you see that what they said is true, and there's this baby, and he's going to be the, the king. And you're so excited, and you're telling people, we need to have that kind of excitement too. We need to realize we have, we have the solution to, to death. The wages of sin is death, but it doesn't have to be that way. We have the gospel. So we've talked about these ideas that the good news is ordained by God, arranged by whoever God wants to use to arrange things, even today, through events. Adapted to by Joseph and Mary, and we can adapt in our lives to, to things that maybe don't aren't our plan, but they happen. And we, we deal with that and adapt and glorify God in our lives. We saw these things were proclaimed by angels to the shepherds, and we saw the shepherds then, in turn, proclaim those things and praised God as well. And we should do the same thing. We should be sharing the good news as well. So for our final verse, Luke 2, 11, from our text. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. We think about how he's the Savior. We're, we're lost in sin, but Jesus is the answer. We have victory over sin and death, and we're lost without him. He's our Savior, and he's the Savior of the world. We need to share that with others. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. This Jesus is fulfilling all the scriptures. All the scriptures were leading to him. Jesus is uh, the fulfillment of all those things. He's the, the coming Messiah King, and he has come. And Jesus is Lord, not just a baby that's cute, but he's our Lord. He's our master. He's God on earth in the flesh. And he demands that we submit to him and obey him. He's our savior. So if there's anything you can, you need to do today to respond to that, do you need to rededicate yourself? to sharing the gospel? Do you need to obey the gospel? And the question here in our, in our song, 347, is who will follow Jesus? And the answer is in the chorus, chorus there at the very end. Master, here am I. We, we will follow Jesus. So I encourage you to follow Jesus. If there's any way we can help you to obey the gospel or to get on the right track, we invite you to come as we stand and sing the song.